Yeah, this is the capstone panel, folks. I mean, we are so grateful for you two gentlemen to be participating here. I mean, our first ever space conference in Mitchell, Mitchell Space, the Mitchell Institute, and to have two chiefs of air services of our very close allies here and present today, this afternoon is really our, our blessing. So thank you for your time and participation in our event today. And let me just dive right into this if I could. So, um, and it will be a generic question for both, you know, Air Chief Marshall Weeks and I'll, I'll begin with you. You know, as you look to the men and women of the RAF, what do you see as their key roles and missions that you want them to be prepared to deliver through space? And how do you see these capabilities impacting the United Kingdom's broader national security enterprise? Yeah, that's not a small question, yeah. but, <laughs> but Chile, if I may, I, I, I'll start by saying, so I, I recognize that from a UK perspective, the irony of sitting here in Washington and talking about our, uh, our journey in space does, uh, you know, does feel a little bit hollow uh, compared to the amazing things that the United States does across the space, across the space enterprise. So forgive me uh, if, if I sound like uh, I am, I've come across the Atlantic to, uh, to preach to, uh, to you here. I certainly haven't. And what I'm going to do, I hope, is give you a sense of what it feels like to be catching up uh, to what it feels like to be in uh, you know, leading an air force uh, on behalf of the defense in the UK that recognizes that we've got a race on, that recognizes that we're behind where we need to be. We are a long way behind where the United States is. And, and I hope that my experience, and I'm sure it, it will chime with Lucas, will give you a sense of where the rest of the world is or, or where the rest of the world that we are partners with is. Because I, I recognize that my experience mirrors many, many of our allies, your, your allies. And, um, and so if, if I may, I'd, I'd, I'd just ask you to sort of take my comments with, with that in mind, recognizing our different starting position. But for the, for the Royal Air Force, the Royal Air Force has not been active in space in a, in a launch and operating space systems sense but we have got a very, very strong record of investing in the human capital of space. And we have done that, as you know, in partnership with the US Air Force and then latterly the US Space Force. So I'm very fortunate that I've got a, a, a deep reservoir of people with space experience, even though we were bit part players as a nation in space. And my first challenge if you like, not, not for the men and women of the Royal Air Force, but actually across government and across the, the nation in the UK has been to wake people up to the changing threat con uh, context. And that has partly been a problem of the classification of what's been going on. It's, it's all very well to stand there, to stand there uh, you know, like uh, Hen Henny Penny, the sky is falling in. But if you can't back it up with uh, imagery and intelligence because it's not releasable and you can't release it to the public it's really difficult to have a have a credible conversation but by and large over the last six to ten years that's what we've managed to have and it and it's culminated last year in us establishing the uk space command a uh, a, uh, a a sub-unified command that sits under the air force a model that many of our allies have adopted, and and it's uh, and it's a model where the Royal Air Force runs it on behalf of defence with people from the Army and the Navy as well as the Air Force, our civil service, our, our partners from across government, and crucially, uh, our industry partners as well. Because as as we in this room recognise, space and space operations in particular has has always been a a collaborative enterprise. So. The challenge for me has not been educating our people about, about space, nor has it been about increasing the expertise and the, and the reservoir of expertise. The challenges have been about awakening our government and our nation to what is going on in space and why, whilst we all benefit for everything in our day-to-day day -day modern lives that makes, makes life easy and efficient and comfortable, is reliant on space. The fact that we can no longer take that for granted 
the fact that we need to understand what is going on with nefarious actors like China and Russia, the fact that we need to call them out when, when that, is, that is going on, and then we need to prioritize, we need to back up our, our words with, with uh, some hard resource decisions, some funding decisions that by and large the UK is now on the path to making. So it, it is. It has been a journey over the last um, uh, over the last decade. I know DT talks about a, in inflection points in the in the you know around sort of ten eight ten years ago, and that's exactly how how it's happened in the United Kingdom. And and uh, we're at the start of a of a uh, of a series of big investment decisions as we build our understanding of what's going on in space as we understand how better to protect our national interests in space and how we, uh, and then should we need to, how we defend those national interests in space and, and without, you know, and it goes without saying that that's sort of, of our allies as well. Very good, thank you, sir. And John Goretti, I'll, I'll ask you the same thing, but what are some of the key roles and missions you see that the Italian Air Force seeks to either execute or achieve the ability to execute in the future and uh, with regard to space and how that, how does, how do you envision that impacting Italy's military's capabilities and national security posture? Yeah. First of all, let, let, let me thank Mitchell Institute to having me here on board, but I apologize for my English, you know, mm -hmm. can you imagine with the American speaking their own language and the British speaking the perfect English, being in the <laughs> my Italian, being, being in the middle of those two guys is a nightmare for me. So I apologize. I put my hands in front, and uh, please don't blame on me on my languages. You know, but uh, you know I try to make it better in language uh, speakers uh, as uh, much we proceed uh, on the on the speech. But this is your fault, actually. <laughs> the decision uh, on uh, what uh, ha we have to do in, in Italy, the space, is completely your fault. Uh, I was trained in the United States, um, and uh, I was posted as a deputy chief of cabinet by the Minister of Defense uh, in 2008. And then I started to think, uh, what about if we be invaded by missiles up from the space? So how can we defend our country for that. So I asked to the former air chief, we need to do something. And guess what? I get no reply. No reply. It was so useless, not thinkable, nothing. So it was uh, something that frustrated me. You know, we said maybe one day we need to face something and we need to think about it. And then I, I was uh, here as a defense attache. Uh, on, on, uh, for three years. Uh, so I, my curiosity started to, to see, why don't we go around to your marvelous countries and think and talk and think and talk. And then I had the figure that we had to, to do something to grow up our people on space domain. So we, but you, you know that when the, you started something in, in your country that nobody trusts you, you need to create a strategy, a, a, a communication strategy to win. So I first uh, had the possibility to meet with some of uh, your friends, uh, Branson, Elon Musk. I asked to meet them. And I bought actually one flight from uh, the Virgin Galactic when I was here. Then I came back as a deputy air chief and I started pushing the air chief to say, we need to do something, we need to do something. We need to prepare our people for space. And guess what, now I'm a, I'm a chief. <laughs> no, I'm a chief, so I have to do something. So, uh, 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 so I, 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 I haven't uh, forget anything that uh, I was in, that I had in my mind. So I decided to just, do need, we need to increase our knowledge on space. I'm responsible for the air defense on my country. I'm responsible to to defend the portion of the NATO countries on my behalf. So uh, the thing I ask to the fellow Americans, please help me, help me to learn, help me to set a normal path for our young cadets to believe on space. Uh, and this is something that, that we need to do it. You know, we are like uh, Mike uh, said, uh, not like the United States, you know, uh, very involved on space, 
uh, we had a very long story related to space uh, launch. So we decided just to use the history to create a credibility. And then we took some people, uh, we got a list of engineers, of pilots, uh, technical people, experts on space. They were all spreading around the country. We put all together and I ordered them to go to one single place. And we built up a spatial situation awareness center uh, just to learn how to detect, detect the breeze. And then we, again, we, we establish, uh, thanks to, to you, a very good relationship with your space command, a very good relationship with your uh, people in Bundaberg. Now we are linked to them. So we cover the world, monitoring all the debris that uh, we share information with them. So we are increasing this kind of uh, willingness of be part of the space domain. And we change the name change the name of the Air Force in a space force. And guess what? The Navy and the Army, they were pissed. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's, it's normal. It's normal. <laughs> I don't argue. I don't ever argue with something down, uh, down deep in the sea. But I don't accept no one to argue that we are relevant on space. And this is some, my fight, my actual fight. Uh, but I need people, I need people behind me that can prove that we are relevant on space. And this is the strategy we have put in place. So we are committed on satellites. We are committed on launching small satellites. We are committed on uh, human flying in space. We are committed on uh, suborbital, suborbital flights. And we are committed also on uh, uh, astronomical platforms for ISRs. Those are the strategy they are now in place in Italy. Terrific, thanks. Um, don't sell yourself short in space in Italy. I, yeah. When I was at NASA working on the International Space Station program, you, the Italians built some wonderful, wonderful components for the International Space Station program were essential in the assembly. So you, you do have a long history of, yeah. of manned space flight participation in civil space. So it's great to hear uh, both. Both of you sound like I think perhaps we were back in the mid 80s, early 80s, when we were trying as a Air Force to stand up a space part of the Air Force early on and get people interested in how important it was. And so uh, your journey will happen much faster than ours, I'm yeah. sure, certain given the threats today. If I, if I could just uh, talk a little bit more about a, a service responsibility, at least the way I would look at it. So as, as if, um, when I was commander of STRATCOM and we had the space mission, well, let me go to a regional combatant commander. Regional combatant commander is going to look to uh, his or her air component and say, okay, go off and get your air superiority. Great, do that. But what can you do for the land component, the naval component to help them be successful and to each of his or her components to make sure they bring integrated fires to bear against the adversary? Um, I would think the same would be true for US Space Force, that they would want to look to their service components, air, land, and see who organize, train, and equip, build things, to build things that can actually hold adversary space assets at risk. Um, we, we talked a little earlier, an earlier panel suggested, well, you know, our Air Force can go drop a bomb on part of their ground infrastructure. Perhaps there's a cyber element of that as well because to affect the command and control. But there's also holding satellites at risk and air platforms are, are suited as, we proved back in the 1980s in the US, um, they're, they're suitable platforms for directing either kinetic or directed energy or other types of assets to hold adversary satellites at risk. Do you envision this at all as a role for your services in support of not just your space equities, but the coalition space equities going forward? And Sir Michael, we'll start with you. Yeah, I, so I, um, I, I I think there is, this is absolutely something that we need to tease through in the conceptual space and understand what it would take. I, I think going back one to where we are today, uh, and, and, and you, you will recognize, and, and I'm sure it's been sort of discussed earlier today, 
the the enormously rapid expansion of uh, and, and congestion that we're seeing in space and and the absence of any rules around that so so before you're before you're holding a potential adversary at risk before you are um, uh, actually in a in a deterrence situation mm -hmm. actually having a having an understanding of what are the sort of rules and norms of responsible behavior in space and if we can getting the united nations to actually sign up to to something along those along those lines to reduce space threats is is a starting point and then you can start having a a deterrence and if necessary a an, an uh, a discussion around effectors in space and and the work that um, the UK, the US, and in fact, many many of the countries uh, represented in the room here are doing in the United Nations at the moment with the open-ended working group on that is a really important first step. In terms of the um, that, that conversation around responsible behaviors, there's a fine balance. So the United States, uh, at, at followed this year by the, the United Kingdom, have declared a uh, that we will not do any direct ascent anti-satellite testing, and you know, and again, this this speaks to that uh, you know, that responsible behaviours in space, that that ambition that space will be there for the benefit of all, and a an aspiration that by doing things like this, that we don't have to get into the space where we are talking about holding an adversary satellites at risk. But there is no doubt from what we're seeing from actors like China and Russia that they have a different view. And we can't sit there and allow them to carry on and do nothing. And so we have to understand what the threat is. So my point about that, about space domain awareness, my number one priority, and, and I think that is shared with many of our allies, is, is space domain awareness. Not not just in Leo, but out there in the you know out out there in the geo belt, in the places where we are not seeing what we need to see at the moment, and we need to really get after that. And and then there is a conversation around space control. Now, whether that space control bites into a energy weapon or kinetic weapon uh, from an aircraft holding satellites at risk, or whether are, there are other ways of exercising space control well technology has the answers and it is an area of work that we are uh, absolutely involved in but as i say step one is is uh is, is space domain awareness because actually without that nothing else matters it's first principles isn't it yeah. in any domain right yeah great well and i love that it was brought up also on our earlier panel the the importance of diplomacy here and the importance of efforts for developing standards of behavior. Um, but, you know, you know, we always look at deterrence through the dime, uh, all elements of national power, diplomacy, information, military, and economic. And, uh, and uh, so it, 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 we lead with D for sure, yeah. but uh, we, we wanna make sure we have the other pieces in place as well. Yeah, I, I, I mean, if I, 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 I mean, no doubt that, I mean, the language of space, whether you talk about space as, a, as an operational domain or as a war fighting domain, it's, mm -hmm. It's definitely one for that that gets uh, academics hot under the cover color, color. Um, but uh, but but the reality is is that we you know we do need to think through and we do need to exercise what those scenarios are and we need to exercise as allies because this won't be uh, this won't be a lone battle. This will affect the the world and the the world that wants you know that. That wants to prevent this needs to be thinking through this, and that's why the uh, the leadership of the United States is is so important in this, and has been so powerful in recent years through through things like uh, Olympic Defender, through the Combined uh, Space Operations Initiative. The, these are these are ways that we can bring like-minded allies together to work towards a keeping space free and open and available for all. But if if, if I could and I know I'm in a room full of uh, space experts, but if, if I could level one criticism against the space, the military space community is that the, the war gaming, the scenario planning, the solutions tend to be by space, in space, through space. 
And to your point about dime, actually the solution might be in a server farm in North Korea, mm -hmm. or the, you know, the solution might be an entirely, you know, you know might be terrestrial and, and actually the solution might be at sea, it might be under the sea, but, but making, but bringing space, military space planning out of the shadows, engaging in a truly joint all domain uh, exercising mindset is a really important part of it. And it's difficult because of the level of classification of some of what goes on up there. Right, and we're gonna pull that classification thread here in a little bit. I know that's a hot topic as well. And, and to your point about cross domain, you know, I've always said my favorite cyber weapon is a Mark 84 into a server farm. It's, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's yeah. the cyber effect and it's kind of fun Preferably to watch. in North Texas. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So General Gavetti, can, can you envision the, 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 your air service, your Italian Air Force, um, providing capability to beyond situational awareness, which is certainly important as we've talked about, but capabilities that uh, help with help to deter adversarial behavior and in an event deterrence fails, um, fight and win in this domain. You know, I, I might add that, you know, I fully agree with uh, Mike said that space is a domain for everyone. You know, we cannot live without everything that is working on space our communication systems, our cellular phones, uh, our information sharing, everything, even the, the press, even the movies, even the, the TV broadcasting mm -hmm. are made in space. So these kind of things has to live without any problems. Uh, and we have to think how to protect this free area for everyone. And But one other thing we have to consider that we are providing services from space also to the other services, <laughs> land, maybe carbonated for us also. Mm -hmm. you know, they need information. We can provide information. But on the other hand, we have to protect those kind of things to be failed. Uh, and we cannot afford just to uh, wait and see. And one thing that actually we recognize is it has to be done is uh, a way to avoid that someone can just put in jeopardy our systems that are already in the space. Like uh, controlling the movements of the satellites, mm -hmm. controlling the paths of the satellites, controlling the distances between satellites, why those satellites, for instance, are coming closer together. Why they, somebody, China, Russia, whatever, they're uh, changing the path of their satellites just to be close to ours. How can we protect? Is uh, a way to protect by using other tools or by moving our satellites to other spots? Or do we need to do something to have a situation of awareness? And uh, I agree with uh, Mike said, it's not only a matter for a single country. So if we are all convinced that we have to protect our freedom of communication, our freedom of data sharing, our freedom of the regular daily life, we all have to work together in a common path to protect our survivability, territorial survivability, terrain survivability mm -hmm. from something that for something that's stuck in the space. And that can be done only if you are united if we share information and the uh, uh, United States can play a big role. You know, there are leaders on those in these fields and we are now committed to, to join and work with them. Like uh, Mike said, and uh, we are in the process to, to be on board and uh, present what we get, you know, just to fulfill the task to protect actually what's going on up this, in the space. The other, on the other hand, we cannot afford to wait too longer to have a, a kind of legislation or rules mm -hmm. in the space like we had in our air domain. But that cannot be done only by one country. Like Mike mentioned, probably has to be done by the United Nations community, uh, some big communities in order to set a common idea to protect our 
regular life, regularly life. And this is not easy because that means that anyone has to withdraw from the power he gets so far. And this is something that you have to think about. How are we able to do a step back for what we conquer in the space to have the overall community safer for data sharing, information sharing for regular life? And this is something that I doubt it will, uh, we, will we will succeed. You doubt? I doubt. Yeah. Well, national interests all often come in conflict there. Certainly the United Nations had a rule about not invading the country next to you. <laughs> and uh, we see how well the Russians have obeyed that right. rule. So to your point, yeah, it's, it's, it's an ideal and one we should always strive for. And that would be very, very difficult. But, but need to prepare for yeah. the alternative, I guess. But let's, let's go on to, I'm gonna show you what in American idiom is a softball. So an easy one to hit out of the park. And that is your views on uh, sharing of information as it is today, um, particularly in the classified area and where we are. And then what, what you would envision, what would ideally, you would like to see ideally for the future so that we can um, truly operate as a coalition. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Let me start with you, General Gray, this time. Uh, I will start with an example. If you're playing soccer, football, and the ball has to go through all the players, they need to know the objective at the end. But if you do know the objective, when we receive the ball, we don't know what to do. And this same situation happened when you have information and you don't pass information to anyone that you believe and trust to be alive. And this is something that's very, very critical because we do need to have information even classified information, because that gives us the possibility to anticipate trends, to anticipate situation awareness that can put in jeopardy our country or our uh, uh, no, partners. Mm -hmm. partners. So uh, and this is difficult because the tendency is to protect the information and not give it to anyone. But uh, don't forget, that if you don't give information to someone, nowadays, we will look for other ways to get information. We might be solid enough to stay put on a coalition like us for NATO, like mm -hmm. us for European Union, like us for the transatlantic, mm -hmm. despite the government changes. Mm -hmm. But you might find a country that make a different decision and turn out for another place. Because they don't have the information. Because they don't have information. Yeah. Uh, so can we afford to lose those friends mm -hmm. to become enemies because we are not sharing information? I think that this is uh, not a good idea. We saw this similar situation with Turkey. Turkey is a part of the NATO. Now they are buying something from Russia. So how can we combine those equipment with ours? That means we need to share something or we need to withdraw Turkey to a place. Mm -hmm. So we lost someone. Leave, leaving it alone. Mm -hmm. so, and this is the same situation for our space. If we have information, let's share. Not everything, but at least let's open a small door, a small window to increase the knowledge of our technicians so they can learn. They increase their knowledge and not easily just be on the same equal level, but at least have the possibility to raise their proficiency. From then on, you know that they are friends. Okay. This is something that you have to pursue. Thank you. So Michael, would you like to pitch in? Yes, I, I, it, it's, it is absolutely critical. Uh, I know that's, that's not a surprise that I'm saying that. Um, the, the space enterprise is so data rich and data dependent mm -hmm. 
and the enormous volume of data that all of our you know, collective uh, activities in space generates. So, so first and foremost, a, a seamless way to, 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 to be able to share that data around the, you know, the protocols and the, 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 common, uh, you know, the commonality of language and the interdependent, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the interdependence of the, of the language as well. So, so it, it is fundamental to what we do. And, and that's not just between military allies, that, that is across the space enterprise with, with industry, with commercial partners and, and with, with allies and with, uh, you know, and, and with uh, non-aligned states as well. Because sharing as much as we can and having the means to share what we can becomes a, a fundamental part of that, the, of that global resilience and, and that, that deterrence of any malign actors in space. I think the, if we get into the more sort of technical military sense, the, the, the strides that the Department of the Air Force has made around uh, only, only classifying material nationally where you really, where there is a compelling reason to, and actually everything else should be releasable to our allies in a, in a military sense, is making a difference. And we're, and we're already seeing the benefits of, of that. I also think the way that, because we recognize that much of our military capability is, is either um, uh, purchased as a service from a commercial provider, or at least is lodged on a commercial platform, the importance of sharing the understanding as far as we can with our commercial partners within our space operation centers. So the establishment of commercial integration cells of, of commercial operation cells around the world. So it's a 24 hour sun never sets uh, activity, again, becomes a really, really important part of that, of, of that information um, uh, ecosystem, which will be the, which will be the, the fundamental essence of, um, of, of our resilience in space. And then finally around information sharing, it is that uh, that ability to expose the, and, and understand the gaps and seams between different systems and different capabilities, so that if I, you know if I've got um, money to invest, if if J, if Jay Raymond's got money to invest or Luca, we can understand that we can target it where we need to, and so understanding each other's uh, capability, you know, space architecture, understanding. Uh, having a common lexicon, a common language about what we're talking about, and then being able to invest in a way that is complementary and is supported. In fact, that gets to the heart of one of the main working groups within the Combined Space Operations Initiative, which, which is the you know, Capability and Architectures Working Group. That, that's, that's information sharing. That's not information sharing about a clear and present threat. That's information sharing about how we're going to build our space out architecture for the next 30 years. But it's just as important. So th this this is um, this is about data. It's about lexicon. It's about uh, principles of sharing. It's about government, military, and and commercial. And for us to have a resilient and safe and secure space domain into the future, which is available for a you know, as a global commons, th this is essential. And, and the leadership of the United States in this is critical and because because without it, we won't get anywhere. Great. Thank you. And General Gray, to your point, um, I think there's two semi-recent examples of where the U.S. shared information that helped build understanding. And one would be General Willie Shelton when he was the commander of Air Force Space Command then before the Space Force stood up, argued for and was permitted to disclose our constellation of satellites at geosynchronous orbit, who are really just neighborhood watch satellites, the GSAP constellation, to let uh, potential adversaries know that we're watching. Uh, that was important for deterrence, for sure, uh, revealing that information to all. And I think the second one was uh, General Raymond's um, argument, which he won to disclose what the Russians were doing with their nesting doll satellite, yeah. for lack of a better term, in flying in close proximity to our high value reconnaissance assets in space. Um, it, it both uh, educates our allies on the 
the reality of the threat and also lets our adversaries know that we're aware of what they're doing and willing to do something about it. If I may, those two events triggers the interest of our politicians because they were asking us, technical experts, what happened? Mm -hmm. Why happened it? Can we prevent this? And that was something that we used to present the fact that we need to think about space and protect our data sharing. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we all have to present that we are eager to solve these problems. So the more we talk, mm -hmm. the more we speak, the more we share from, uh, from our perspective to everyone, the better would be the situation because everyone knows what's going on. If they know that we are monitoring them, if they know how can we protect our systems, maybe it would be safer and find good lawyers to find a way to make an act to establish a situation up in the space similar to the one that we had on, on the ground or on the mm -hmm. middle level of the atmosphere. Right. Or at sea. Yeah, or at sea. Or at sea. Or right. under the sea. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and, it's another place. Yeah. So, Michael, but, but uh, Chile, that, that example that you gave of um, calling out the, uh, the, the the Cosmos Russian doll. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, again, I, I, I speak about CSPO a lot, but th this goes to the value of um, of CSPO because the international position around calling that out, which was a, a remarkable step. Um, uh, in, in policy terms by governments that had, had not previously been prepared to call out bad behaviors in space. Um, it, was, it was the value of the conversations around the CSPO table uh, with our, with our sort of policy officials and, and uh, foreign policy officials that, that enabled us to reach a common position, a common international position to call out what was blatantly bad behavior it was the releasing of a projectile with the characteristic of a weapon in close proximity to very high value assets that um that that was a a a, a, a sort of a crossing the rubicon moment in terms of how we will continue to call out bad behaviors and we have now done so with a couple of destructive tests which have you know in fact this time last year Near, nearly a year ago, the, Russian, the Russians uh, did exactly that. And, and again, calling it out, condemning it, and, and, um, and, and, and using the, the power of the international community, uh, and, you know, whether that's effective with a country like Russia is debatable, but it certainly gives them force to thought. And, um, you know, and I think the, the power of coming together as an international community, not just in the in terms of releasing what was hitherto very classified information but the power of an international response a collective response uh, is something that you know it is as important in that in that instance as the actual um uh the release of the, of the information itself right great well before we go to questions from the audience i i, I would really love to hear uh, what your reflections are on what is happening in the ukraine right now and how that may have shaped uh, some of your views on the importance of space, the vulnerability of space, where uh, as you start thinking going forward from any lessons learned uh, to date and observing those operations, uh, what's on your mind uh, in the space domain? And right. Okay. Okay. Michael, go ahead. So I, I think it's been eye-opening to see the agility and um, uh, innovative approach taken by sort of commercial providers in terms of uh, communications and imagery. And I'm, I'm sure there are representatives in the room here today. You know, congratulations for those of you that have played a part in that, in sustaining the Ukrainian fight. Um, it's, it, 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 it matters. It, it's not just a matter of Ukraine territorial integrity. It's not just about European security. This is global security. You know, we cannot allow uh, countries like Russia, uh, brutal, you know, brutal invasion, illegal invasion, and try, you know, attempting to achieve 
political ends through using force and through an invasion of a sovereign, sovereign country. So those of you in the room that have played a part in that, thank, thank you on behalf of all of us. It was really impressive to see. Mm -hmm. It also, we now recognize that, Ru that Russia recognizes the significance of that. And so Russia now talking about you know, threatening those commercial providers, uh, you know, quite sinister threats. And it's something that we've all got to, going back to that, this is an enterprise. We've all got to th think through the implications of that. There is undoubted strategic advantage, tactical advantage of, 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 the, of, of what commercial pro providers can now offer. But it's also about uh, how we as a collective make sure that that service is assured and, and, we, uh, and we help protect it. The, the other aspect I think is that in the early days, that there was an, you know, with, with an understanding of, of what Russia had already demonstrated it was able to do in space. And when it was picking up the, the increasing reliance of Ukraine on, on space, it was a, uh, you know, an expectation of the conflict potentially transitioning into space. And there was, you know, there was uh, that, that potential given what we had already seen Russia doing and the reckless way that they had prosecuted their campaign. You know, thankfully, that didn't happen in any significant sense, although we all recognize that, that there have been and there are ongoing attempts to, uh, to, to interfere and disrupt satellite services um, in, in and around Ukraine. So it, it's playing a vital part. The, the imagery, the commercially available imagery is allowing us to understand and help the Ukrainian forces. It's allowing us to challenge and call out Russian um, uh, misinformation and propaganda. It will help the international tribunal, which undoubtedly will happen and will prosecute Russians for war crimes. And, uh, and it will be evidence from satellites that will provide that. And above all, in communications terms, you've allowed Ukraine to stay in touch with the world. And the, you know, this is absolutely critical. It's been a critical, probably unsung part of this campaign, um, but, but there is no doubt that uh, space is playing a, a really important part. Thank you. John Gray? Uh, if I may add that uh, the one that you did as a commercial satellites was a strategic message to the Russians that we are not dealing only with military affairs. We are dealing also with global affairs where all the people involved are playing a role. We are playing a role to protect the boundaries of NATO countries using our jets, using our equipments. You with your system are protecting the freedom of commercial information. And they also, you protect the possibility to the people that want to get back their freedom to believe that they will find somebody ready to help them. So this is something very, very strategic using commercial satellites. And again, like Mike said, we, were, we had the feeling that uh, we might have some problems uh, using satellites uh, with some uh, activities uh, made by the Russians. It was not the case. But the information we gave to them, the trust that we gave to them using your imageries was very, very helpful to build up the confidence of the troops that were in the ground, they were ready to fight and succeed after the first couple of weeks of a defeating situation. Now they are egos, they're egos to, to win. Now we have to control them, of course, you know? but we turn out using your imageries, using the trust in NATO countries, NATO alliances, are with them to protect one thing, the freedom of a country, the freedom of a people to decide what they want, no matter what. We cannot afford ever to have somebody to say that your freedom is no longer active. Let's give the people of Ukraine decide what they want to do. We ought to have the possibility to give them all the possibility to survive and make decisions. 
We are not pushing the decision for them, but we need to give them the possibility to raise their head and decide their own lives. And this is the only message we sent, but not with the military side, with all the community. So we used your commercial satellites and that was very, very helpful. Also to build, increase the, the knowledge of our people in our country, because they saw the images, they saw the casualties, they saw the things they did. So they build up a thinking that what we have to do if we have to defeat our country, are we able to defend the same way like the Ukrainian people are defending their country? So this is something that was very, very worthy. And then I, again, I, I joined Mike and, and uh, we are working closely together, you can imagine, you know, and, uh, and it, it was a very great prove that uh, NATO countries willing is very, very solid on the government level, on the military level, on the technical level, on the cruise level. But we need your strength and uh, an opportunity just to have those kind of people winning their, uh, their fight. For us, it's for us, not for them, it's for us. Thank you, General. Thank you both. Um, I think we have time for just a couple of questions for the panel. So um, one, I got the General Deptula, my boss just said, we have time for one question from the audience. So uh, put your hand up if you, if you would like to ask a question. I see anybody up oh, in the back, please. To Mike, right? <laughs> Actually, it's to both of you. I'm Captain. Uh, uh, Justine Pichatello Parr, I'm the weapons officer for the S-58. I work for Lieutenant General Grant directly. Um, the Space Force is gearing up to start our third annual December event where we, um, as guardians, reach out to classrooms all over the United States and we teach our children about the space domain. Um, for both of you, what actions do your organizations take in your nations to increase interest in space and to increase uh, knowledge of the space domain across your population? It's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great question. And, and actually, it's a very easy question. Thank you, because it is amazing how much space and talk about space excites young, young people. And, it, and what I find is that it's a fantastic way. It's a door opener into having a much wider conversation about science and technology and engineering and you know, careers in aerospace and space and cyberspace. So it, it captures the imagination like nothing else. And, and, and whether it's um, the, uh, uh, the uh, UK astronauts like Tim Peake, or whether it's some of the amazing things that are, that are going on, particularly um, in, in the US in, in a space launch sense, or, or here in the, UK, or, or in the UK next month, we're going to be launching uh, a, a horizontal launch um, uh, payload from, for the first time from UK soil with, with Virgin Orbit. For the Royal Air Force, we've been able to be part of that because we're doing a responsive launch trial as part of it. And we have carried the payload and the rocket across in a C-17. And, 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 and we are learning about how we can uh, it, you know, we, 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 we can, with a relatively modest footprint, launch a payload from, a, from the 747 anywhere in the world. And, uh, and this is really exciting young people in the UK. So, so it's, a, it's an easy question because it's something that we put a lot of investment in and I know that we will reap the dividends in future and, and because it appeals to all parts of society. Um, and you know, and that's, a, yeah, and that's a really important challenge for all of us. Thanks for the question. And thanks to Mike. You know, uh, next year, we'll be celebrating 100 year of uh, Air Force. Of course, they did it. I copied all. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm honest. I copy all he knows. Uh, I will be using the, uh, all the events celebrating our 100 year birthday to speak about space, to speak 
about airspace to speak about something that is in the air. And uh, I'm doing this, not only presenting satellites, people going to the ISS, but by starting with, uh, with an idea for the young people. We were used to all to dream to fly using paper aircraft. So we started to celebrate our anniversary with uh, an event that says, from the paper to the space. So if you have a dream, like I had a dream to fly, so I was used to, to throw those kind of papers over the window and see the distances I can reach. I thought that we might use the same tools to have those young guys dreaming to go to space with the same attitude that we had for flying. That it has changed for hundred years because the passion, the attitude and the willing to, and the curiosity is still the same. It's different, the scenario, it's different, the, the, the space domain. So we need to create a very simple message to the old young generation to see that, to present to them that there is a great opportunity to work with all the space activities and domain. So they will have fun to join space so we can have the solution to be protected by them. Because they will do it without thinking because they are willing to be in space since the beginning. I don't know if I answered correct. Thank you, Dan. That you. was terrific. Thank you. And you've all been invited to the Italian 100th. Well, of course. Uh, that's right. <laughs> of course. He pays. He pays. <laughs> and one, one more thing. One other thing that uh, joined us, uh, we are celebrating our new government at the same day. Yeah. Right. Well, I, I didn't mention this at the beginning, but these two gentlemen both started their aviation careers flying tornadoes. So they've gone from 50 feet and 500 knots to thinking about Keplerian motion at, uh, at geosynchronous orbits even. Uh, and I started in the RF-4C, a little higher altitude, but equal speed, because uh, we're a little more conservative in the US. Um, I think it's proof that we're trainable. Gentlemen, ultimately, <laughs> and I have no doubt, you know, you apologize for your lack of space expertise to the start of this panel. Um, I it just reflect how, how uh, fortunate the United States of America is to have you as allies and have the focus that you have on the space domain and the willingness to participate. In it. Thank you.